firstly, I'd like to say how pleased I am and delighted I am to be with you all here today in the wonderful uh, city of Limerick and to uh, meet a few familiar faces already out there over coffee and indeed make a few connections. So I'm really delighted uh, to be with you. Um, this is in fact my first LIA conference and here I am rather cheekily stepping up to the stage already. Um, and I must admit that I was absolutely delighted when Pat first asked me to present at today's conference a few months ago. At that stage it was long enough before the event to immediately say yes without really worrying too much and then obviously the event starts to get closer and closer and I started to think to myself well why me and indeed what can I offer such an esteemed collection of experienced financial advisors. The first rule of public speaking is try to get on the side of your audience from the, from the start so I hope you'll appreciate that one. Um, so indeed, yes, why me? Well, I aim to offer you all today um, my experience of being involved in sales and relationship building within my various roles and career paths over the last 30 years. Yeah, I, I think Kevin said 25, I probably uh, embroidered that a little bit, but yes, it has been nearly 30 years now. I uh, obviously started at a very, very young age. Um, my first role was with a bank called Lloyds Bank, and my first position uh, was in a branch in a place called High Hoban in London. And I can recall actually my first ever sale um, was a youth saver account to a parent of a little toddler. And I recommended this account as a regular saver account just into a, a normal deposit. So that was my first sale. And I've, I can recall the buzz um, that I got from that almost 30 years ago. And I say the parents delighted by now because by my calculation there must be at least 70,000 in that youth saver account. Um, rather sadly, the Lloyds Bank branch is now a shirt and tie emporium. Uh, nothing to do with me, I hasten to add. But then I went into other roles within Lloyds Bank in the branches. I worked my way up through the ranks and managed a number of branches in in the City of London and I worked in business banking as well so building strong relationships with my business customers and always with sales targets. And then I moved over here to Ireland and I joined Bank of Ireland Life initially as a financial advisor so I was based in uh, a number of the branches, my branches were Stevens Green and, and College Green and so I was delighted to be in those branches and continue uh, my role in a sales and selling capacity and building those relationships. And then I did some sales coaching training and became a sales manager for Bank of Ireland Life. And today, what am I doing now? Well, I work for Accenture. Uh, and I've worked with Accenture for about six years. But I still believe that I'm in the world of sales because every day I'm trying to win hearts and minds out there. Um, that the concept of personal improvement and self-improvement is really important. I'm trying to offer something of real value to my clients to fulfill a need that they may, may not even be aware of and do it in a way that appeals to them, which in essence is what I believe selling is all about. So today, folks, I'll be sharing with you some concepts, some strategies, some best practices that I've acquired, largely, I must admit, from copying other people. Some of what I will share with you is from research in my role as a sales trainer, some recent papers, some books and, and literature around selling in today's world. We know that we live in a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. That The world of selling has changed immeasurably over the last 10 years. Even in one particular area, the impact of technology has led to massive changes. The ease of access to the internet has meant that forever the landscape within which we operate as salespeople has changed immeasurably. Offering, of course, yes, real benefits, but also challenges. Indeed, 93% of buying processes now start with an internet search. That's why I wanted to talk to you today about why forming and maintaining strong relationships is so vital in today's world, that we renew our customer relationships regularly, we monitor and understand our buyers' changing needs in this current environment, and we deliver sustained value, recognising that there's a critical difference between a short-term sale and a transaction, and building a long-lasting, enduring relationship. One thing I sincerely believe is that through a keen and disciplined focus on your relationships, you'll undoubtedly make more sales, 
win more referrals, and thereby enhance your income, all through being of superior service to your customers. And that certainly is my wish for you as we embark on this presentation today. So I'm going to hope that the technology works, and seamlessly it does. Thank you. These are the topics that I'll be looking at. Firstly, how to make an instant and long-lasting connection with your client. I'll then talk to you about how to win your client's trust and maintain it. And finally, communicating in a way that commands attention and gains commitment. So really what we're looking at is rapport, trust and communication. We can see there's an element of overlap between those three things, certainly. They're not mutually exclusive. But what I believe is that rapport, trust and communication form the divine trinity of effective selling. And before I start on that, I just want to pause for a moment and talk about knowledge, particularly when, as a trainer and coach, um, I'm often in front of adult learners who have a lot of experience, so I'm very cognizant of the audience. And I have to think of what I deliver. Will it be relevant? Can you directly link this to your business when you leave here today? Can you transfer it pl practically and ap apply it to your daily goals? And can you draw on the great experience that you already have in the room and just enhance it. So with that in mind, what I'm looking at is the three R's of knowledge. Firstly, remind. Some of what I talk about today, you will have perhaps done in the past, and for whatever reason, you've forgotten to do it or you stopped doing it. What I hope today is that you'll be reminded of those things and get back to doing them. Some of the things will be reinforced. Those are things you already do. These are the ones that you can nod wisely to yourself and perhaps whisper to the person next to you in a rather gloating fashion that, yes, I'm doing those things, thank you very much. And that's great. But what I'm saying is let's have more consistency to that, make sure that we really embed them as great habits. And thirdly, reveal. I do hope that there'll be a number of things that I'll offer to you today which may be new to you, that you can actually use in a very practical way for your business and to develop your relationships. So where's our starting point with our relationships and why isn't it always easy and straightforward to develop and maintain relationships in today's world? Very often actually as financial advisors and sales professionals we're starting on the back foot. Research has shown that there's a number of things that people actually have a mistrust and dislike about when it comes to their version of a salesperson. So let's have a look at those things. What do buyers dislike about salespeople? Not listening. Their version of a salesperson is that the person in front of them that's trying to sell to them isn't listening. They're just prescribing their own solution, saying what they think is important without really listening to the needs of the customer. And it's not surprising they're not listening, because guess what they're doing? Talking too much. So it's the old principle of trying to use two ears and one mouth in that ratio. More listening, less talking. And I'm going to refer to listening a number of times as I go through this presentation. And lack of knowledge. I've already said that clients these days come with more knowledge perhaps than they've ever had. Yes, I know in the financial services world that's a very dangerous thing at times, isn't it? But they believe they have that knowledge. So what they're looking for is added value beyond the knowledge they've already acquired. A lack of follow-up. From the salesperson, what they're getting is those idle promises of, I'll phone you tomorrow before close of business, or I'll send you that email today, or I'll pop the brochure in the post to you by the end of the week. And those things either don't happen within the committed time frame, or they don't happen at all. Failure to understand their needs. And why don't we understand their needs? Because we're not asking great, great questions, we're not listening, and we're talking too much. That's their version. Perception is reality, so we need to listen to what the research is like out there for people um, you know, that are buying from us. And finally, ref refusal to take no for an answer. We know in sales we get more no's than yeses, don't we? Um, you know, we need to have that resilience to get the no, rec recognising that a no is just a no not now, not a no forever. So we've got to be careful not to show our impatience and frustration and emit any emotions that might be negative. Exit gracefully if the customer doesn't want to buy right now, knowing that when the time is right for them, they'll remember you and they'll come back to you. 
So now we know the inherent problem, we can make efforts to overcome these challenges and surprise our clients consistently by showing them that we're not at all like this. And I'm not saying that all you sitting in front of me uh, tick all those things, clearly not, but I think we can all agree that at times we may slip into one or two of these areas and that's where we need to sharpen the saw. So today our focus is not on the outcomes but a process, attention to pay to how we get there. We, know that we need a process for our relationships, just like we need a process for any part of our business. We need to know how we're forming our relationships, how we're revitalizing our relationships and staying in touch. We know that our customers may be feeling vulnerable, vulnerable about, about putting their affairs into the hands of others. Maybe they're exposed about revealing important, very private information, and perhaps they're skeptical because they've had a really bad experience in the past. So, let's look at the first topic to address all these issues, which is the topic all around rapport. How to make an instant and long-lasting connection with your client. Put simply, you have rapport with someone when there's a mutual liking and trust. You've established a bond and a connection. And of course, we know once we've established that rapport, our clients are more likely to open up with us, share lots of valuable information, and then we can serve them better because we can actually answer their problems more specifically rather than generically. And we can do that consistently with every client we meet. So how then can we be confident of building really strong and deep-rooted, enduring connections? Well, these are some of the suggestions that I have for building and maintaining rapport. Firstly, our beliefs are important. We need to think of clients as more than just a revenue stream. We need to think of every client as unique with his or her preferences, likes, dislikes, ways of working, how they like to do business, what their values are, what concerns them, what are their issues. The more you can identify with a client as a person, rather than as a chance to increase your income, the stronger the bond between you will grow. Find common ground. How do you find common ground? Well, I expect many of you are doing it over coffee today. We ask open questions, we talk to people, and we listen to what they say. And then we pick up on the commonalities by sharing information about each other. Maybe it's that we attended the same school. You know, we come from the same town, we have a similar sized family, we have kids, or we might have the same interests, beliefs, and values. Finding common ground was actually a rather difficult piece for me um, because, as you may have detected, I'm not originally from around these here parts. Did you guess that? Yeah? Anyone want to hazard a guess as to where I'm from? Surrey, was it? I wish. It's a bit, it's a bit posh, Surrey. Not as posh as Surrey. Southeast, though, of England. Essex. Essex. Who said Essex? Thank you. Essex. Have you heard of Essex? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Don't believe everything you hear about Essex. And I promise you I'm not wearing any fake tan today. <laughs> yes, I come from wonderful Essex. Um, and when I first moved over here, and what brought me over here, do you think? Love of a good woman. I moved over here in 2001 when I married Kira. Happy to report we're still together. 13, 14 years later. Um, but when I first came over here, I found obviously I had less in common. Not markedly so, but there were some differences between the people that I was now meeting and those that I'd met previously in my roles in London. And in fact, even some of the language puzzled me. Why did people keep asking me if there was anything strange? <laughs> Where was this hot press? You know, my wife would say, Paul, can you put something in the hot press? I remember once opening the oven, but anyway. Why were people putting things on the long finger, and was this an affliction that just affected Irish people? And what was acting the maggot? Now that last one, of course, was never directed at me. So guys, I had to get really up to speed with some of the language. And of course, your passion uh, for sport. We won't talk about the rugby right here and now, okay? But I know uh, you Irish are very passionate about your sports, I knew nothing about the GAA. I didn't know what a hurley was, or the rules of hurling. I'm still a little bit weak on that, if I must admit. And no one seemed to be that interested in my chosen team, Ipswich Town Football Club. <laughs> no, 
OK. Well, they're in the playoffs this year, so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. But I had little in common with people. So I had to find common ground by doing that through ways of working, through sharing information about myself, by building their trust maybe in other ways first. And, of course, doing some homework, really finding out who the person is before the call, do my prep and research about their business, about them as an individual, and what might be of interest to them. So all those things really helped me when I first moved over here into my sales role. And really then, started, I started to make some really strong connections and, and found that common ground. And then, focusing on your appearance. You might wonder about that one. Why is it that focusing on your appearance is an important element to building rapport? Well, it's really about do, does the client get what they're expecting in terms of the way we appear? So are we, you know, very professionally dressed? Are we well dressed? Or is it creating a bit of a barrier to our uh, rapport building? If you imagine, if you will, you're going to see your solicitor and you turned up at your solicitor's office and they were wearing shorts and a t-shirt. You might be a little bit surprised by that. And it might, start to, uh, it might start to weaken the rapport because it's jolted. It's something different than what you're expecting. Rapport's about making people feel comfortable. So are we dressed the way? Do we appear the way that they're expecting? We've all heard about empathy, no doubt. And I'll talk about this a number of times, but showing empathy is about understanding other people from their perspective, recognising their emotions. And once you achieve this, it's easier to get on their level. Although we may not agree with everything our clients say, and very often I find myself not agreeing because they've only got a modicum of knowledge. They think they've got lots of knowledge through the internet, etc. But we know perhaps that it's misplaced. Maybe we don't agree, but we understand from where they're standing what their position is. We stand in their shoes for a while. And then body language. Watch your body language and theirs. And what I mean by that is, you know, how are they exhibiting their emotions? Are they excited, enthusiastic? In which case, we need to mirror that behaviour. We need to be open, gesture etc. Or if they're more reserved, you know, we may come across too over-exuberant and scare the bejesus out of them. Bejesus, see the little Irish term I picked up. <laughs> I often scare the bejesus out of people, actually. I've had to tone down the body language on occasions. And of course, the way we talk, the tempo of our voice, how soft we talk. If someone's softly spoken, that again, we lower the voice uh, volume down, the tempo, the pace, all these things are really important. The body language and the tone of voice, the tempo, the pace. All this makes the other person feel comfortable, they open up to you, and most importantly, it makes them feel that they're understood. Okay? So all this will ensure that they're at ease and therefore give us more information, which means we can serve them better, which after all is what we really want to do. We can diagnose their problems more easily and be brilliant at the basics. Don't forget the basics. And we've all heard these, but they're, they're, we hear them for a reason. They're tried and tested. You know, the firm handshake, the eye contact, you know, the stance actually delivering our whole attention to that person at that moment, facing them, instead of being distracted by the mobile phone or the computer or even somebody in the background. Those people I was talking to today, fortunately no one looked over my shoulder as if to say, I'm trying to get rid of your man here. But you know what I mean, even that slight glance away at any stage can break rapport. So let's remember those, those basics. And what about if we've lost rapport? I think we've all had clients whereby we may have lost rapport over the years. Perhaps we've, you know, not, there's nothing deliberate that's happened, but maybe we've just lost contact. So what we need to do is re-establish rapport with those clients. And there'll be certain ways of doing that. I think we need to be humble and to say and explain honestly and simply what happened. Um, if we need to apologise for anything, then do so. And fo focus on ways of repairing any broken trust. Making an extra effort to put in extra work if you need to do that. So transparency and showing a genuine concern for the other person's needs will go a long way in rebuilding that trust and re-establishing rapport. So talking of trust, my second topic. Developing strong rapport is in itself one way of building and maintaining trust. Trust is the bedrock to influencing clients. Why should you worry about trust? Well, it's the greatest determinant of success than anything else. If you want to get things done efficiently, successfully, and with ease, then build trust. Technical mastery of our disciplines is no longer enough. 
The art of selling means that we have to achieve the level of a trusted advisor. This is a competent sales professional with the expertise to clearly articulate product and service benefits while effectively educating the buyer so that he or she can make a well-informed decision. That's a direct quote from a book called The Trusted Advisor, which I'm going to refer to. It's a book by David Maester, Charles Green, and Robert Galford. And these three authors talk about something called the trust equation. And I think this is a really valuable piece, and I came across this several years ago, but I often refer to it. I think it's really important and um, speaks a lot to us as financial advisors. So what we're doing here is we're combining actions under each heading based on the audience and their unique perspectives and personality. And we know their unique perspectives because we've shown empathy, we've listened. So I've looked at this in terms of the financial advisor role. And we'll look at both the rational and the emotional components. What we can see here is that we need to build credibility, reliability, and intimacy. And with self-orientation, we need to lower that so that trust increases. So I want to walk you through each of those headings and give you some tips and best practices that I've seen that work in those areas. So the first area is all about credibility. Credibility is about our words. The client's thinking, can I trust this person that what they are saying is true? So we have to show we've done our homework. Today's buyers are demanding that sales professionals know who they are before the call, what their business is, some personal information, potential likes and dislikes. They'll do a Google search on us, so we have to do a Google search on them. OK, look on LinkedIn or their business website. Finding out some information, that's doing your homework. And if we met them before, get up to speed with the file on what happened at the last meeting. What was the last commitment? Have a point of view. Too few salespeople will take the risk of having a point of view because they fear putting a stake in the ground and sharing their ideas, opinions and perspectives. Perhaps fearing initial rejection and that what they might say may be initially unpopular. And you, may, and you will be saying it, of course, from a perspective of genuine concern for your client and that then builds trust. And your point of view is a catalyst for encouraging active engagement with your clients. Don't sit on the fence. Have that point of view. Don't forget it's built on your vast experience, your expertise, and that will add to the credibility. And talk about truth. Always speak the truth. I'm sure you're sitting there saying, Paul, we always speak the truth. We never tell any lies. What I'm talking about here is not over-exaggerating anything. And even those little white lies, you know, if we're late for the meeting or we forgot to call them, clients can see through that. So we need to make sure that we don't damage our reputation by speaking anything other than the truth, always. And finally, for credibility, combine your words with presence. Some of you may have heard that words actually make up 7% of our communication. The rest is our body language and the way we say those words. Imagine if I come out here today and I walked out here and I said, I'm really delighted to be with you all here this morning. Would you believe me? No. You know, I lack credibility. So we can see that the body language and the tone need to convey an energy and enthusiasm around your subject matter. The second area then is reliability. This is all about our actions. Here the client's thinking, can I trust her to carry out what she has said she will do? We need to start on day one by making lots of small promises and keeping them. I'll give you an example of this, very recently actually. I did some business with a salesperson who I met in Dublin a couple of weeks ago. And we met, we discussed. He had great listening skills, had about an hour's meeting. At the end of the meeting, he said, Paul, I'm going to hang back in the hotel for 15, 20 minutes, type up my notes. By the time you get home, my email will be in your inbox. I got home, turned on my laptop, his email was in my inbox. Tick. I then responded to his email. He came back to me within an hour and said to me, thanks for getting back to me. I'll give you an update on Tuesday. This was Friday. I'll give you an update on Tuesday. And Tuesday morning. And guess what? It was Tuesday morning. I didn't have to wait all day. It was Tuesday morning. And he updated me. Tick. 
And then he said, Paul, I'll give you further progress on how this is progressing by Friday. Or actually, he didn't say by Friday, he said on Friday. This guy was very specific about his deadlines. And again, he phoned me on Friday. Now, there had been some small problem. OK, he phoned me on Friday, he dealt with me on Tuesday. OK, there had been some small problem that on Friday he brought me up to speed with it. It had just occurred. And I know with this guy, if it occurred earlier in the week, he'd be on to me straight away. But he kept his promises, he delivered on his commitments. And this was a guy that I first did some business with in 2001. And I hadn't seen him since. But when I had a similar kind of need, I thought of him amongst everybody else that I'd met. And I looked, up, looked him up online. I was delighted to see that he was still in the same business. And I contacted him. And I told him the reason why I was contacting him was, he is unique. So. We need to make those promises and deliver quietly and on time. That is a key differentiator. And always be on time for your meetings, for your calls. That's just one way of showing that you're true to your word. Being late may leave your client thinking, well, they've broken their promise here. How many other promises will they break? And with that in mind, always meet your deadlines. Your word is your bond, and it should be a guiding principle in all your client relationships. So when you're going to do something, there should be no question in your client's mind that you won't do it. We shouldn't have them worrying when they've left the meeting or the call whether the action will actually transpire and whether we'll do what we'll say we'll do. We need to take all that worry away. Reducing that worry will build trust. And we need to anticipate what our client needs and not wait for them to initiate everything. So following through in your deadlines shows that your interactions, through your interactions, there's progress, there's access because the client has access to you and you're readily available. And remember, everything matters. You know, this means the, the shake of the hand, the eye contact, the shine on the shoes, the pen you use, the file you take out, being on time, everything matters. And I'm reminded with this principle of a guy called David Brailsford. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of David Brailsford. But he's headed up the Great Britain cycling team over the last decade, and the squad has become the most successful British team in any sport at a world and Olympic level. And he thought about everything matters when he coached this team. It's come from his belief around marginal gains. So I'll talk to you about what his principle is on marginal gains. But let me quote him for a moment. He said, the principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything that you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improved it by just 1%, you'll get a significant increase when you put them all together. So the team started by optimizing the things that you might expect. The nutrition of the riders, their weekly training program, the ergonomics of the bike seat, the weight of the tires, etc. But Brailsford and his team didn't stop there. They searched for 1% improvements in tiny areas that the other teams hadn't considered. Things that were overlooked by almost everyone else. Discovering the pillow that offered the best night's sleep for the athletes and taking them with them to the hotels. Testing for the most effective type of massage gel for the physiotherapist if there were any injuries. Teaching their riders the best way to wash their hands to avoid infection, which could have led to an increase in temperature and obviously a decrease in performance. They searched for 1% improvements everywhere. Every aspect of their lives improved, as well as their bikes. So it was a more holistic strategy, embracing technological developments and also athlete psychology. As a result, the team enjoyed great success in the 2008 and 2012 Olympics with 16 gold medals. And Brailsford also oversaw Bradley Wiggins' victory at the 2012 Tour de France. So I think he's a fellow that we can listen to and this concept of marginal gains says that really all those things are tiny things, but if you clump them together, they make a big difference. So, the last is intimacy. How intimate are you with your clients? I'm looking you in the eye at this point. What do we mean by intimacy? Okay, so intimacy is about our emotions. Here the client's thinking, am I comfortable opening up to this person? And are they opening up to me? Most products are not bought because, because of logic, but emotion. So how do you increase intimacy? It's really about scaling everything back and being straightforward, honest, and close to your client. 
So, name the elephant in the room. Bring up that topic that you least feel like bringing up right at the beginning of the meeting, rather than carrying it like a ball and chain through your meeting. This could be anything. It might be some poor service they've received that we need to apologise for. It could be the fees that are being charged, or the performance of a fund, etc. Listen with empathy. I've mentioned these before. But what this really means is it's not about agreeing with everything. We need to seek first to understand their point of view and then be understood. Before we, need, before we can help anybody and perhaps change their mind, we need to know what's going on in their mind in the first place. So let's create an environment where they express their concerns, their issues and their needs. And we also need to listen to what's different, not just what's familiar and all that, those bits that confirm our preconceived stance and views. Enter their world rather than forcing them into ours. Then we can offer a point of view, and even one then that differs from theirs. You've earned that right to be heard by giving that gift in the first place. Tell them what you appreciate about them. I'm sure you're sitting there saying, well, Paul, I do appreciate my clients, of course I do. But do we tell them regularly that we appreciate that referral they gave us, or the business they've done with us in the past, even if they're not doing something with us today? Or simply they've been a long-standing client. Never take anything for granted and show an interest beyond the specifics of the task. And always, sorry, always use their name. Address people by name. Remembering names is a really important skill. It's the most beautiful word in that person's language. In fact, as children, it's the first thing we learn to write. And this can quickly become a very good habit and a good example of a marginal gain. You know, I don't cut much sway with people who say I'm just not good at remembering names. I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to make an effort to remember names. Working in a training centre, as you'd imagine, and having lots of people, hundreds of people through that centre over the year that meet me and they remember my name because I've trained them, I have to be good at this. But I have a process around it. I can't possibly remember just off the cuff everybody's name. So my process for that is in the training centre, in the learning zone where I tend to work most of the time in Dublin, I look at the participants that are coming through our door that day, and there might be eight or ten courses. So there could be a hundred people or so coming through the door. And I scan through their names just to see if there's any familiar names that jolt my memory about who they are. That's a process that I've got used to, and then I can use their name. It's called doing our homework. And if it's been a while and we really can't remember, then we need to be honest about that and say so. And uh, Michael, where's Michael, who I met, met in, I think you call it the Jacks here? Um, uh, where's Michael? Yes, I, I'd forgotten Michael's name, it had been a while, um, but I asked him, uh, what's your name? And he told me, and still spoke to me, even though I'd forgotten his name. Um, but it relieves you of the embarrassment then. How many times have we stood there thinking, Jesus, what's your man's name? Or who's the lady in front of us? You ever done that? I know I've been there as well. I mean, is it John, is it Joe, is it Jeff? Oh my goodness, what's their name? And we're not listening to anything they're saying, we're just panicking. Okay? So we just need to be honest about it. If we have forgotten it, just be honest about it. One little tip as well, um, something that I do regularly, is if I get a phone call from somebody and the number just comes up with no name, I've not spoken to them before, maybe they need to talk to them about something, and I have a good conversation with them. Immediately I hang up on that call, I plug their name into my contacts, so that next time they ring me, their name will flash up as I answer the phone. So I can say, oh, hi, Marie, how are you? Great to hear from you again. Rather than just saying, hello, Paul Dicker, who's this? OK? Again, it's a marginal gain. So through intimacy, we act more like a person rather than just someone in a role. And let's look at low self-orientation. Remember, this is the one underneath that we need to keep low. So here, this is about our motives. The client's thinking, am I their true motivation? Or is it all about them? We need to give away ideas. Bring three to five new ideas on every call and meeting and share unreservedly. Be a useful resource. Share information that you believe the clients will find useful, whether or not it benefits you immediately in any way. In the same respect, refrain from bombarding them with lots of emails and lots of information on stuff that won't likely interest them. And we must develop that knowledge advantage so that we're perceived as the client's key resource in this area. So staying ahead of and on top of key trends and industry news. 
then we're seen as somebody not just who can diagnose the problem, but also who can interact, counsel, and suggest creative solutions. All this will ensure that people keep you in mind for when they're ready to buy, even if it's not immediately. Build a shared agenda. So again, this comes around through our preparation, our listening, and then building a plan. And be willing to advise your own opinion of what you think is the right way. Have a we, not me attitude, because people buy for their reasons and not our reasons. Have a vision of partnership. Let them know that you're actively motivated to help them. And they'll soon begin to see you as more than just a vendor or supplier, and more that you're the right person to do business with, both this time and in the future. And you're the right person for their connections to do business with. And ensure that your website, your LinkedIn profiles, your social media presence conveys who you are and the values that you want to convey. Avoid premature problem solving. I think as, my, as a role as a trainer and as a coach, this is one area that I particularly saw prevalent. I've sat in on hundreds and hundreds of sales meetings um, over the years, you know, sitting in a corner while the salesperson's there with the customer. Um, and watching and observing what's going on. And I think this is the key problem, the, pro the premature problem solving. What happens is the client mentions something they're having a problem with, and we immediately dive in with what we think is the solution before pro properly diagnosing. Okay? And that's done because, of course, we want to help the client, but we're just doing it too quickly. We need to slow down, take our time, explore the problem fully, and then think about solving it when we have full information. Resist the temptation. It is tempting, I know, I've been there. The temptation to prove ourselves by coming up with an immediate solution. And turn down the internal chatter. That's that little voice that goes off in your head all the time. You know that little voice that's in your mind when you're with the your client? It doesn't look like they've brought their pen with them today. This person doesn't look like they've got much money. Do you have that little voice in your head? Even those of you who are sitting there thinking, I don't have a little voice in my head. You've got a little voice saying, I don't have a little voice in my head. So, take a breath, relax your mind, focus. Keep the customer at the centre. And do slow down your rate of speech and your delivery. And keep in control your emotions. Yes, some clients will press buttons. We're emotion, emotional human beings. So we might get a bit frustrated or impatient. Just tune into it and say, look, I'm reacting like that. Hold it lightly and then move on. Get back into focusing and really listening. So, there we've looked at low self-orientation and the trust equation. So before I move on to my final topic, let's review. Building trust, we said it's about increasing credibility, increasing reliability, increasing intimacy, and underneath the equation, lowering our self-orientation all in an effort to build trust. So now let's think about how we communicate in a way that leverages this trust and ensures commitment. So, there's no such thing as over-communicating. We need to help our clients to understand their options, evaluate them, and once we've recommended what's best for them, allow them to choose. Actively, have I mentioned listening today? Just a couple of times. But there's a reason for that. It's across every single one of the points that I'm talking about because it's the most vital skill. Every time you really listen, you strengthen the relationship with your client. And yes, it's a complex and not an easy thing to do. It involves hearing, seeing, comprehending, and interpreting communication. Are you really listening to the prospect or are you just waiting for your chance to talk? We know you can't fake listening. So pay attention to three things the words your client's saying, how they're feeling, and what actions they're likely to take. And also, really tune into what they're saying as well as what aren't they saying, and spot any assumptions that they're making. We must allow the client to feel that we have all the time in the world to hear them. And ask great questions. We've all heard about the open questions, yes? So ask great open questions to get lots of information. I commonly use the mnemonic TED. I don't know if anybody's been on my courses, but TED, standing for tell me, explain, describe. Great way to start conversations and get the customer to open up. 
to tell me what your main objective is for today's meeting. Explain what's happened in the past and how this problem arose. Describe what would be the best way to add value for you today. All that will ensure that we get really rich information. And we end up then solving the real problem for our clients. It will stimulate reflection. The great questions will invite deep thinking and engage them in meaningful discussion. And let's think about giving information in a way that helps the buyer make a decision. Who's in front of us? We know we have a myriad of types. Here's just a few. The relator, the relator type. What they want is someone who's warm, relaxed, pleasant, shows concern. Are they in front of you today? The thinker, they want logic, accuracy, precision, detail, something systematic and precise. The director, what does the director want? Well, the director wants you to make them feel important, wants you to get to the point, say what you do with conviction and stand up for yourself and your recommendations. And then you have the socialiser. They're playful. They may want a bit of humour, fun, and anything that will make them look good and having great conversations. That's what the socialisers want. And when we're presenting back, how do we get that commitment? By starting with the most important benefits first. Really getting their attention. Given all the information we've collected, we can now be very confident in our presentation that what we're presenting is specific, tailor-made for the client. It's about customising your pitch rather than leading with a product. So, getting that commitment, how do we do that? Well, we need to be clear about what we'll be doing and what they'll be doing. And this is an important concept that I came across. I remember a boss coming in to me, and uh, at that time, I was struggling a little bit in sales. My figures weren't hitting the targets. So he'd come to have a gentle word with me. You know that kind of gentle word? Um, and I remember him sitting down in front of me, and he pointed to the file on my desk that had the word potential on it. And it was a huge file with potential. He said, what's that file there? I said, well, Joe, they're all the customers. They haven't quite made their minds up yet, but I know they're going to do business. He said to me, well, what are they doing in the meantime? What steps do they take? I said, well, they're just waiting for me to go back to them. And yeah, well, what's the client doing? I said, well, I'm just going to go back to them in a couple of months when they've had a chance to think about it. He picked up that file and put it straight in the bin. Now, I must admit, when he left, I did rummage around in the bin and drag it. But he made a good point, you know. What I was thinking about was that those people had committed and they actually hadn't committed. You know, they weren't really clearly defined next steps. They'd just been kind of putting me off. So we mustn't have a fear of offending that means we never get around to mentioning the reason you met them and have those long good meetings that I have plenty of, but that end in that odd result-free limbo where neither party knows what to do next. You know, how many of our sales meetings are sabotaged because we fear offending the person in front of us. So we need to take charge, define what happens next. And remember, sales is all about those next steps. OK? So those next steps for your client may be digging out a policy. You know, committing to a second meeting where the wife or the husband will come uh, to the second meeting. Sending something in to you. But getting them to do something. And using positive, positive future-orientated language. So to get that commitment and communicate it in a way that's forward thinking. So saying things like, that's great. So how should we proceed? What I'd like to do next with you is this. And the way we can progress this is by doing these things. So our positive future language should look to the next stage, whether that be completing the application, getting more information, having a second meeting. And use the language they've used. This is a really important one as well. And it also helps with rapport. If during the meeting the customers used to perhaps say the word concern. So I'm concerned that my family would be left without an income if I got seriously ill. Then we need to use the word that person's used, you know, when we convey it back. So the language is, you mentioned earlier, you'd be concerned. Not using the word worry. That doesn't resonate with them as strongly as the word that they've used. So again, that, that builds and strengthens the rapport. And of course, it demonstrates that we've really listened to them. And also, ask them what will help them make the decision and how you can help them to do that. I recall when I was in Bank of Ireland Life, at one stage I was the great brochure giver away. -er. So when the client said, can I have a brochure please, Paul? Of course you can. Here's a brochure. 
Here's another brochure. I was destroying a large number of trees in the process. So I stopped this process, not just to save the planet, but also to win more business. And again, I copied this from seeing somebody else do it. I said, of course I can give you the brochure, but let me ask you, what is it you're looking for specifically in there that I can help you with today? And guess what? Very often it was something that wasn't even in that brochure. So it might be, well, I'm just not sure about the affordability, or I'm not certain whether this particular illness is covered. And a fellow down the pub told me, okay? They wouldn't have found that information in the brochure. So I deal with it and dealt with it there and then. So we need to actually isolate any objections. Find out what's the real objection here and deal with them. Always remembering, of course, that it's the customer's right to choose. What happens if they don't want to commit there, regardless of any efforts we've made to help them come to a decision? What if they say no? It could, after all, be a question of time. Where are you when they need you? Will they remember you? That's why we add value by staying in touch and ensuring that their commitment's to you when they're ready to buy and need your service. So, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. And I started it by showing those things that people dislike about salespeople. And I've explored in depth with you three key tenets of building and maintaining really strong relationships. Building strong connections through a focus on rapport, maintaining trust, and communicating in a, an engaging way that ensures commitment. So the hallmarks of a trusted advisor emerging from these core principles are they provide a fresh perspective and challenge assumptions, converting all those inputs they've got through the conversation that they've had into a vision which encompasses all that the clients told them, solving their problems, being courageous through challenging assumptions and adding real value. Stating reasons, not just conclusions. So again, not prematurely problem solving. Bringing up issues and undisclosed problems that the customer hasn't even thought of, all because of your rich experience and expertise. And thereby helping the customer think beyond their own initial solution, introducing points of view that weren't previously considered. They tell us the truth, even when it makes us feel uncomfortable. So we need to do that one. We need to have that point of view and not sit on the fence. We prescribe, diagnose, and advise. Okay, so, you know, making sure that our recommendations align with what the customers told us. And we provide options, suitable options that encompass all our experience from what we've heard today in the meeting and our existing knowledge. We never force the issue, but we recommend and let the client choose. Ultimately, we let them make up their mind in light of all we've discussed, but we're not afraid similarly to make recommendations and have that point of view. Remember, if customers could diagnose their own problems and come up with solutions themselves, then they'd only need order takers. We are trusted advisors who add value, who give palatable options and explore ideas not previously considered. So finally, the benefits. We have clients who accept and act on what you recommend knowing that it's in their best interest because you've shown your credibility, your reliability, your intimacy. You've lowered the self-orientation in all your dealings. We have clients who will share more information, okay, so um, that we share more information with and they'll share more information with us, which means that we can help them even more. They'll open up to us. And they'll refer business knowing that we could be trusted to help their friends, colleagues, and family. And we'll clearly differentiate ourselves as financial advisors on how we focus on great relationships. In today's competitive world, we need to find a way to really stand out amongst the myriad of other providers out there. Consistency of what you do every day with your relationships will build your brand and ultimately differentiate you from those who prefer the easier path of less effort and therefore less success. And remember the marginal gains. None of what I presented to you today is necessarily a huge change from what you're doing already. But do reflect on those small things you can do that cumulatively will deliver superior results for you and your businesses. Great strong relationships are built on the foundation of daily habits. What are your daily habits? Are they still working for you? Have you looked at them recently? Are they pulling you in the wrong direction when it comes to forming strong relationships? 
Or are they pulling me in the right direction, but you just need to go a little bit further? Remember, it's what we consistently do in sales that will make far more difference to our income than what we do once in a while. We know, folks, that in today's world, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we live in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. And we can't control completely everything out there. But what we can control is the effort we put into building those strong relationships. I know all of you have existing relationships which you've nurtured over many years. But I hope that this presentation on this really important topic has provided you with some reminders, some reinforcers and some reveals that will further strengthen these bonds and help you to build new connections into the future. I do want to finish. I think it's time for me, being over here 13 years, to publicly say, is it Kupla Fockel? So here we go. <clears throat> Mila Bricus, August Bwan Tatnif Os on Law. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Winston Churchill was giving an address, something probably similar to this. And there was a reporter sitting down in the audience, and he noticed that uh, Mr. Churchill was waving a card in his hand. And as he was addressing the audience, he kept waving this card around, but he never seemed to refer to it at all. And after it, um, the reporter approached him and said to him, Mr. Churchill, why did you feel the need to hold that card in your hand uh, during your presentation when you didn't appear to refer to it all? And um, Churchill looked at the reporter and said, my good man, it gave my audience confidence, right? But what I want to assure you today that these index cards in my hand are not to give you confidence, but to make sure I don't forget what I'm going to say. Um, before I get into my presentation, I want to acknowledge two things, and then I want to park them and leave them there. I'll be 30, 34 years in the business this June, and for the first maybe five or six years that I was in the business, nothing had changed in well over a hundred years. Basically, absolutely nothing. In my first four or five years in the business, nothing had changed in well over a hundred years. I'll show you what I mean by that later. And then, all of a sudden, it's like somebody put a stick of dynamite into the business and just completely changed it. And what I'm referring to there is both regulation and education. I just want to mention one thing about them and then I want to move on because that's not what today is about. But I want to point out that I personally believe that in my time in the business, from the time that regulation and education started to come in, I think it has transformed the business, has turned it into a profession, and it has made us the professionals that we are today. I'm a big supporter of both the regulation. I think the regulation has even opened up other areas of business and I would be a big supporter of the education as well. That's all I'm going to say about that. I just wanted to make that point. The next point I want to make, in my time in the business, with the arrival of regulation and education, um, we seem to have moved away from the notion of selling something to anybody. And it's probably because in, in trying to shift the business along, move it along, bring it up, that we've done down the whole commercial aspect of having to sell something to somebody. And all I wanted to point out is that if you're in business today, in any business, any profession, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter what you are doing. You have to sell something to somebody or it doesn't work. The bottom line won't increase if you're not selling something to somebody. So I just want to make that point because I feel sometimes in our profession at the moment we're gradually trying to move away from that. Again, just before I move on, uh, I, what I want to do is I want to pose a question. When a client accepts that the advice you have given is right for them, and 
a deal is closed out. I'll just refer to it that way at the moment. Business is agreed. When they have accepted that the advice you have given them is correct for them, and you close out that deal. When you're finished with that client, when they're leaving your office, or you're leaving their office, or their home, or wherever you're doing it, when you're walking away with that deal done, do you feel excited or relieved? So I'm going to ask you that again, but I'm not going to answer it until we get to the end. When a deal is done, do you feel excited or relieved as you're driving home in the car, leaving the appointment, or they've just left the office? How do you feel about that deal? For the rest of the presentation, I just want to leave that sitting out there, and we're going to come back to it at the end. Now, sorry, hold on, I just have to get used to this. Success from sharing. I mentioned to you earlier, I'm 34 years in the business this June, and anything I say here today, I, and I hope that you will go away with just a couple of ideas, but anything I say to you, I didn't come up with myself. I learned from attending functions like this, through many, many LIA functions, through many, many functions at MDRT, through speaking to other professionals out there, I picked up ideas from all over the place. And as I go through the presentation, I'm going to try to point out to you and give credit where credit is due when I picked it up. I am a big, big believer and supporter that sharing in this business, and funny enough, sharing in every business, but it is just something in our business that I believe we are very good at, sharing ideas in this business, I'm a big supporter of it. It's fantastic, and we are able to do this. I'm a big believer of it. Now, I've waited a long time to say this in public, um, not everybody holds that view that sharing is good. And I want to tell you a quick story about my daughter. My daughter is now 18, she'll be 19 later in the year. She did her leaving cert last year, she's heading off to Southampton in September to take up a position in the university doing nursing. When she was very, very small, and I mean really small, four or five. Anybody here who has had children, will have children in the future, must, I'm sure, know of Barney the dinosaur. Okay? And funny enough, the colours that LIA are using today are very good. Well, Barney the dinosaur has a phrase, and it's, sharing is caring. Well, my daughter, when she was four and five, had a different take on that. When parties would be held at the house, birthday parties, or she'd have friends over playing, she'd have all her toys and she'd have them around, and of course there'd be usual rows, I want to play with this, I want to play with that, blah, blah, blah. And you would go over to Laura, and excuse me, I'm gonna move away from this for a minute. You'd go over to Laura and you'd say to Laura, now Laura, sharing is caring. And she'd look up at you and she'd say to you, Daddy, I don't share and I don't care. <laughs> so luckily enough, or what I wanted to say there was, this is a girl that's now going on to be a nurse. God help the patients <laughs> when they cop a load of her, Laura. Okay. I mentioned earlier that I'm 34 years in the business, and sorry if I keep repeating that. Um, and that in my first four or five years, six years, not a, absolutely nothing had changed in well over 100 years. I'm going to explain to you why I say that to you. This gentleman up here is my great grandfather. He was born in 1864, 98 years before I was born. He was born in Strathaven in Scotland, and at the age of six, he was an orphan. He had a job at the age of six. He was a runner in the mines in Scotland, the coal mines. Now a runner at that stage, it, he, it, was, it was described as being a, a tea boy and a runner. He would make tea for the miners when they'd come up out of the mines and he would run back and forth and get them various messages and so on and so forth. Now, we don't know why, but even at six or seven or maybe it was eight by the time he, he copped on that 
this wasn't really going to make much of a living for him. And he looked to get a job as a butcher boy. And he got the job. But what he didn't realize at the time was that as a butcher boy, he was going to have to be able to read, add, and subtract, which he couldn't do. As luck would have it, as it always does in these type of situations, he was taken in by the butcher and his wife. The butcher's wife, her name was Mrs. Burns. She was a school teacher. And they agreed to, uh, he would work, they would give him lodging and boards, and they would teach him how to read and write and do his arithmetic. That went on for some time, and he subsequently left. He joined the army, came back from the army, and couldn't uh, get a job. So he went back down the mines, this time as a miner. Also though, which is interesting, went down, then regarded as an educated man. Um, and at that time, the miners in Scotland were setting up individual mines, uh, miners' funds, sorry. Each of the mines were developing their own funds. Now, they weren't structured in any great way other than what they would do is when you would get a shift and you weren't sure you were going to get a shift every day, you wouldn't sure you'd be get a, a day's work all the time. But when you would and you'd come back up from the mine, um, this man here, Patrick McGrory's job, was when you came back up with your shilling, maybe from the shift, his job was to convince you to hand up one penny to go into the miners' fund, which was to pay for any injuries or deaths down the mine to help compensate widows uh, of accidents in the mine. So he had to try to sell this. So the first thing you saw when you came back up out of the mine, maybe not having a shift for a couple of days, was this fellow waiting to look to get a penny out of you. But they used to gather up the money anyway, and uh, the, the, the claims were paid out of that. It wasn't long, you know, I want to point out, these mines, they were individual things, it wasn't an organised thing, they just, if you, if you organised it in one mine, that was fine. Um, but it mightn't be in another mine. Eventually, of course, it didn't take long for the insurance companies, and there wasn't a great many of them at that time, to come along to spot that there was an opportunity here. And lo and behold, British legal, arrived at the mine where my great-grandfather was working and wanted to establish a more regular basis for collecting this money and the old penny policies and this type of stuff. And of course, how do you do that? You try to convince the people that are in support of it to come along and work with you. So from that, my great-grandfather got a job with the British legal. He was subsequently sent over to Northern Ireland and then he was set up as a, the district manager based in Dundalk in County Louth. Um, he had seven children, five sons and two daughters. His two eldest sons, Patrick and Robert McGrory, went into the business with him working as agents. Robert McGrory, his second eldest, was my grandfather. Um, now, I want to give you, you're going to pick up a few good sales ideas here. The only issue with them is they're going to be quite old. But very, very interesting. And there's a few points in this letter that I want to come back to. This letter was written on the 5th of April 1913, 102 years ago. And it was written from my great-grandfather to my grandfather. And you can see it's written on official company letterhead. Um, and he's writing to his own son, my grandfather, who was 18 years of age at the time. And at the time this letter was written, had not yet sold one piece of business. He was literally only starting in it. Uh, the other thing, towards the end of the letter, which I'm going to read to you in a minute, uh, there's a whole load of family history in it. So laundry and all is coming out here. Just give me a second till I make sure I have the right one for you. Uh, that's the original of it. I have a, a better version of it here. But there's a few great sales tips from 102 years ago in this. 
Dear Robert, I have been expecting a letter from you all week to let me know how you are getting on. However, Pat, that was Robert's brother, says you are doing fine, and if only half of what he says about you is true, you will be ready to take his book at any time. You promised me some new business, so I hope you will send it on this week. I know you could get some if you try. Just think you are going to see if they require any bread or groceries. And keep in mind that 19 out of 20 people you will speak to know far less about insurance than you do. Just go out and make up your mind to get business, and I am satisfied you will be surprised how easy it is to canvas. Now be sure and write, and let me know how you get on with your first case. Don't forget when canvassing to look as pleasant as possible. Try to make the people sorry to refuse you. <laughs> I'm going to send Pat to Clonus on Thursday for three days to wake up the agent there. <laughs> and don't forget, I will expect to see you surprise Pat with a big list of business when he gets back, for I am very anxious to see you breaking ice. You know, Bob, I'm getting old and can't get through work just as well as I used to do. And when I see how things are at home, I get very downheartened and am able to do nothing. It is only the thought of helping you and your brothers and sisters that keeps me from breaking down altogether. So go ahead now and remember, if you want to help me, you must get on yourself. George as well. Joseph is still in hospital, but from what I hear, I am afraid he'll never be the same again. Lizzie and Francis are all right. Your mother is as usual. Good night, Bob, and God bless. <laughs> so, he gets a letter from his father on an official letter heading, giving him a kick in the you-know-where, and then giving him all the family news. But there are a couple of things in this that I would like to bring up. First of all, I'm amazed and I'm delighted whoever decided that Paul was to go in front of me uh, wins the score, I reckon, for today. Because a couple of things Paul mentioned and bearing in mind, I stress again, this letter is 102 years old. Um, first of all, the bit about uh, make yourself look pleasant or come across pleasant. I thought that was very good because you brought that up. The, one of the uh, crucial things I wanted to mention was, though, that this thing of 19 out of 20 people. Um, funny enough, today even when you think about it, 20 out of 20 wouldn't know as much as what we know. It's got very, very complicated and broad. Um, we should always remember when we're advising clients that it is very, very important that we break down what we're saying, that they can understand what we're saying. It, it's, 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 the business has become so complex and detailed from regulation and from everything else and the type of products that are out there that it is vital that we stick with that. Um, the other point I just want to make is uh, he refers in this letter to, you know, Bob, I'm getting old. He was 49 years of age when he wrote that letter. I'm 52. It's all over for me, obviously. <laughs> he lived till he was 86 years of age. This other son that he refers to it in it, Joe, that was in hospital, also lived till he was well into his 80s. I actually met the man when I was about 14 or 15. I met that fella he's talking about. Um, would have been a grand uncle of mine, I presume, or a grand something of mine. Anyway, I did meet him. Um, so, as you can see, in certain areas, while I agree a whole lot has changed, but in certain areas, not a lot has changed. The other thing I want to do, how do I get back? Uh, oh, yeah. The other thing I just want to point out, if you look at the business card down there in the bottom corner, uh, I know you can't see it from there, but if you could see it, you'd notice there's no phone number on it. And it isn't that they didn't have a phone, it's that none of the clients had a telephone, right? They had a phone, but you weren't ringing anyone. You either walked around selling business, or if you were lucky enough, you went around on your bike, okay? The other letter that you see up there, I want to read to you as well, before I... Uh, move away from the history. Uh, and I only, in, when I was preparing this, I only came across this, uh, I, I've had that letter for many, many years, but I only came across uh, this idea as I went through this letter. 
Um, but before I go into it, when I was being trained in the business, I was always told, Liam, when you're at, at meetings and all that, don't forget to ask for referrals. Get referrals, get referrals. Make sure when you're talking to the client, ask for a referral. And I used to give this a go, but I was never any good at it. I'm still no good at it. I can't do it. I just, it just doesn't work for me. I agree with it, and we do try, and we do do it in the office. But I'm not great at it. So, but I just want to read you this letter, and then I want to give you the seed of an idea that has come into my mind that I picked up from this letter. This letter was written in 1928, when my great-grandfather was retiring. There's two reasons I love it. One for the reason I'm going to tell you in a minute. The other, listen to the English in this letter. And also listen to something else, which I'll come back to you in a minute. But it, it, his manager, manager above him, is writing to him on the day he's retiring, or a couple of days after. Dear sir, in acknowledging the receipt of your resignation as regional agent of the company in the Dundalk district, in order to take up your pension, I desire to take this opportunity of supplementing this tangible recognition on the part of the directors of the service you have rendered in the past by expressing our earnest hope that you will long be spared in health and strength to enjoy the leisure to which your years of service have entitled you. Full stop, new paragraph. Although thus released from active participation in the work in which you have spent so many years, I trust you will always retain a lively interest in the business and that as opportunities come your way, as come they will even in your retirement, for recommending the company and promoting its welfare, you will count it a privilege to do what you can to further its interest and extend its sphere of usefulness. <laughs> Not that long ago, there was a past president of LAA, Brian Johnston. And he said to Brendan Glennon, the then CEO of LIA, Brendan, it's easier to get out of a marriage than it is to get away from the LIA. <laughs> and here we go with this man retiring. And although, well done for all the years service off you go, but don't forget to refer business back to us. <laughs> The seed of the idea that came into my mind a couple of days ago when I was rereading this is there are a lot of people out there that are gradually starting, and always will be, to retire from the financial services industry. And I have often thought, or I am now thinking, that wouldn't it be great in, we're in Drogheda, in, in Drogheda and the surrounding areas, to maybe once every couple of months host a little bit of a light lunch type of thing and invite retired financial services people to attend that for a bit of a networking event. Um, because we that work in the financial services industry, when you leave it, it can be very, very difficult and very, very hard. And you kind of want to keep in touch with people that are in it. So I just picked that up from that. And that's the only reason I wanted to read it out to you. Um, and that's that. Um, now. In my time in the business, I have come to believe. Now, I believe these three things are true of any business, but I believe they are specifically true in ours. And I, what I wanted to try to do is kind of indicate to you under each of these headings what I mean by that. And I want to deal with business disciplines first. Um, this first idea. We've been doing this in OMAC for many years. I picked it up from a TV program. I'm sure most of you would remember it. Maybe not. Hill Street Blues. Um, the first thing I want to say is building the right team. If any of you have staff in your office, this afternoon when you go back or tomorrow morning, sack them. <laughs> Just get rid of them. I believe that as a business discipline, and just before I explain that to you, when I say business disciplines, forget clients. I'm not talking about clients at all here. Park the clients, we'll come back to them in a minute. I'm talking about the business, the structure of the commercial entity that is the business. If you have staff, get rid of them. 
What you need or what I believe is required in this business and it has worked in mine is a team. You need a team around you. Even if that's only one, if you have currently got support staff of one, it's a team you need. And I don't mean by that to just, you know, clap a couple of people on the back and say, well done, you're part of the team. I mean they have to be involved. In OMAC life, every day, bar none, and Paul touched on this earlier as well, when you talk about it's the small things and the, the, the disciplines of them. Every day, without exception, and I'm going to qualify that remark in a minute, but without exception, we have a team meeting in our office every single day. Everybody at that team is well aware of what the expenses for the year for the company are. They're well aware of what the target is. They are well aware, basically, of the bank balance. And they are well aware of what business is going through the system at the moment. And we sit down every day and we go through what we're doing that day and what we're prepping up for the next day and we have a look at what we did the day before. Lasts about a half an hour, but we build a team. Everybody is involved in it. And what I mean by that is that in OMAC, we have a system where, and I'm sure you all have a system the same as this, but what I'm saying is everybody is brought into it. We have a system where we track our potential business, where we're potentially going to get business from. We track it every single day. We try to add names into our list of potentials every day. We try to move names from our potentials into our four completions. We will try to move them from four completions into the pipe, and we will try to move them from the pipe to issued. And every one of the team in OMAC will be well aware of what's going on, well aware. They're involved in the constructing of the target, and the target is usually brought about by deciding, first of all, what the expenses are, light, heat, rent rates, etc., etc. And then we settle on what the sales target is going to be. We work in quarters uh, and we try to attain the target every single quarter. One of the main things that we do at our team meetings, and I'm going to mention this and you're going to see it coming up as I go through again and again, you're going to see it because I think it's the major point that I'd like to get across today. We have review dates. Now, I got that idea many, many, many years ago. When I started in the business, my father, at that stage, had your, your typical insurance brokerage. He did life and pensions, general insurance, and we had an agency with a building society for taking deposits. And as you know, under general insurance, everybody has a renewal date. But we adopted this thing where we would have a review date. So we're able to monitor all the clients have review dates. They're on our software system and we're able to see when the client is due to be reviewed. I'm going to come back to that more and more and more as we go in. But I'm just saying at the meetings, that's what we discuss. Um, review dates are very important because I want to come back and explain to you again about referrals and what we do about getting referrals. Now, this, at our team meeting, this is also one of our biggest assets that we have in our business today. This idea I got from MDRT, not from going over to MDRT, I got it out of a magazine. It is crucial to our business. And what it does is, after you've decided what your expenses for the year are, and after you've decided what the budget is, or the target is, and all the team are aware of it, what you've done there is, you've gotten the horse put in front of the cart, and you're ready to go. But you ever notice the way when you go, start to go through the year, sometimes you can drift a little bit. It's not, you're not keeping it together. And you're wondering why I'm not going anywhere. This is a system. Can I get that back up there? This is, this is a system to keep the horse 
in front of the cart. Let me explain it to you. First thing is, ignore the EPC up there. That's an error on my part, it shouldn't be there. This is a point system that you complete every day at a team meeting. And you make this up any way you want. This is just the one we use. I'm just going to discuss the idea, right? You make this up with whatever you feel you need to be doing. Now, what you're trying to achieve here is to make sure that you are doing the tasks that, that will ultimately generate the business. I'm going to fly down through some of these which are to e explain to you what I mean. The top one up there is clients identified for review. Do you remember I mentioned review dates? Then you'll see under that client files reviewed. Now you might be tempted to think, well, sure, if you've identified them, have you not reviewed them? No. We try to identify people that are going to be reviewed and we score again if we actually have then continued out and reviewed the files. What you're aiming to do on all of these things is accumulate a total of 20 points in a day. There's no carryover. If you get 30 points, you don't get to carry them over to the next day. Okay? You're trying to, to, to accumulate in a day 20 points, right? And what you're trying to do is highlight the tasks that you and the team need to be doing to achieve the bottom line. So we have clients identified for review. We have identified five clients that are up for review. Who are they? Great. Have we reviewed any of those files? No, not yet. We're working on yesterday's or whatever. Clients with IAEs, that's a phrase we use just in OMAC. It's, it's, what we call it is clients with identified areas of exposure. Now, what I mean by that is that can be anything from actual business terms. It can be anything. But it can also be files that need to be updated from a regulation point of view. It, it, it can be anything, right? Prep work completed on IAEs. Have we actually completed the work to go and see the client? Are we ready to see the client, right? Client appointments, business completed, business issued. Now, you would score very low on that, and this is the point I want to make, for business completed. Would only come in at about a two, because the job is done then. The high scores are given for doing the small tasks that lead to the appointment, to the business being completed, to the client file being reviewed. The bottom part of that sheet is all about sourcing out new clients. And you will see down there, uh, where am I? Anyway, you will see somewhere there, referrals sought at a meeting. Um, we score about a 10 on that. We give ourselves a 10 if we do it, because we're very bad at it. So we give ourselves a 10. You could be very good at it. Some of you could be very good. Some of you could be very bad. You pick the scores, and you pick the jobs that you feel need to be done. And you can see all the way down, meeting with COIs, I'll, I'll be talking about them later on, they are what's known as centers of influence. People, that, people or other organizations that can give us business and do give us business. Um, is there anything else there I want? Yes, where down the bottom, if we score on a new client meeting or a new client signed, it's regarded as a home run. You get 20 points. That's the way we do it, okay? Again, I'm saying I'm only giving you an idea here. You score it across each of those days, and your intention is to score 20 points. If you score 30, it's just 20. If you score 15, it's 15. Now, I want to make one point. I am 100% confident that if you score somewhere between 15 and 17 points a day on that sheet, your bottom line will be fine. Your business will grow. Your clients will be well looked after. right? And the bottom line will increase. It's a discipline. It definitely works. And every day, our team in OMAC is involved in completing that. One of the team is directly responsible for business issued. So that member of the team focuses on that, but they're in the team meeting. They get the chance to say, well, I could get it issued if you people go back and get this done or that done or the other done, right? So. That is what we do to make sure we keep the horse in front of the cart. Now, one thing I want to mention here, we run our targets every quarter, as I said to you, and we, help, we use this to help us to get us there. If I was to ask you how many times a year 
you and your team have a party. A party. You probably probably say to me, well, once we have a Christmas party. If you're running a team and that team wins football, soccer, Gaelic, hurling, basketball, doesn't matter. What do most teams do? They party. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's vitally important that when you win, you have a party. And that at the end of every quarter or whatever period you pick for your practice, if the team wins, you party. Now I know that everybody, and I have done it myself as the captain of the team, everybody loves a few extra quid, a bonus, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely don't deny that. You know, but sometimes, and I really mean this, it's very good to say, let's just celebrate the fact that we won. And that's all I'm saying on that. Um, I now want to move on to uh, professional discipline. Now I want to bring in the clients, okay? Um, to start this, I need to put it in context. I regard myself, uh, and I regard my practice and the team working in the practice, but myself personally, I regard myself as a personal financial planner. When anybody asks me out on the street or wherever I might meet them, or somebody asks me, what do you do? I would always say to them, I'm a personal financial planner. Now, there's a reason why I do that. And the reason I do it is, um, I, I have found over the years, uh, you know, I'm a financial advisor. I'm a financial planner. I'm whatever. It's, it, it doesn't... If you go to a solicitor or a doctor or an accountant tomorrow, you have a preconceived notion of what's going to happen. Somebody might say to you, hello, my name's Liam, I'm a solicitor. And your reaction is, yeah, okay, that's great. I know what you do. Don't need a solicitor at the moment, that's fine, but I know what you do, right? So when they go into a solicitor or when they have an issue, they know, oh, I need a solicitor or I need a doctor or I need a chef, whatever, right? And when they go in, they have a preconceived notion. If somebody goes in looking for a chef, they, they, what they're expecting to happen is that chef's going to come and do some catering for them. What I found with, personal, with a financial advisor or a financial planner, from the client or the prospective client, the feed I was getting back was, well, where's, do I need one of those? How would I even know if I needed one? How do I know if I need a financial planner or a financial advisor? So I decided uh, to stick the word personal in front of it. And funny enough, anytime anybody asks me and I say I'm a personal financial planner, usually, funny enough, I will get back, what's that? Or I could do it speaking to you, okay? It's only a very, very small thing, but I have noticed that it does work. It engages the client or the prospective client, much more. Um, yeah. I want to start here with getting paid, right? Now, bearing in mind, I'm basing this on personal financial planning and what we do. And I want to start this on getting paid, but getting paid is going to run through the whole thing. One of the first things that really gets up my goat uh, because I believe it sets us up on the wrong foot, for starters, is where I see um, a lot of advertisements and various things come to us and get a financial review for free. Come to us and we'll do a pension audit for free. That gets up my goat. And the reason it gets up my goat, and the reason it should get up all our goats, is first of all, we're undermining the service that we provide as professionals. And it's not true. It's not free. No matter what way you work it out, it's not free. Okay? And I want to give you a little sum to do. When you go back to the office today, or first thing in the morning, get the total amount of bank lodgements that you put into the bank account in the end of 2014. 
Then go and find out the number of appointments that you completed in 2014 and divide one into the other and you're going to come up with a number. Could be 500, could be 1,000, could be whatever. When you saw EPC on that other slide there, that's what we call, we just titled it many years ago, our earnings per call. Now, I know that most of you out there can quickly work out those two sums do not collate at all together. And I know that. I know they don't collate. Your bank lodgements are made up of initial commissions, fees, renewal commission, and I don't mean trail, renewal on old, uh, say, protection policies, and trail. And some of it refers to a year before. Some of it is instant, where you charge the fee and it came in. So it's not directly related to it. But the reason why I do it and always did it, I found it very, very motivational. Because it gives you a figure that at the end of the day, if there's two things matters, if the bottom line and appointments, so if appointments give you your bottom line, okay, and you divide one into the other, it means that when you're out on an appointment and if your number is 500 euro, every time you're seeing a client, right, whether or not you actually earn that money at the time, right, it's a motivational thing. The other thing is it lets you keep in mind that when you sit down with a client, you are spending money. So what we usually do when we're speaking with clients, we usually say, come in and have a chat with us and our first meeting will be at our expense. Now, when you do that, you open up the whole conversation in and around fees, commissions, whatever you want to bring up. But you're, you're, leading, you're leading first. You're putting the right foot forward at the start. And that is why we would do that. Um, our client offering. You'll hear a lot these days, uh, an awful lot, and, and I fully agree with it, about your client proposition. And this goes back again to being a personal financial advisor and all that. It is absolutely vital, I have found, but it's a bit I want to put on to the end of it. I have found it is absolutely vital that you have to have your client proposition dead pat. What are we, as professional advisors, saying to the client they will get from us, right? What is the proposition? What are we offering them? Very clear and in layman's terms. And I can't stress that enough. In layman's terms. Mr. Client, this is what is on offer. This is my proposition, whatever that is. The crucial bit that I have found, and I learned this about 10 years ago, is how are you going to deliver that proposition? Now bear with me for a minute here, right? What I'm saying is, we have to be very, very clear about what we're saying to the client is the proposition. What are you going to get? But you have to be able to back it up at the first or second meeting with being able to get across to the client how you're actually going to do that. What are you going to bring to bear that's going to make your proposition, which they accept, to become a reality? And to explain to you what I mean, I want to show you this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a drawing of my father. Uh, I know he looks an awful lot worse than my great-grandfather, but believe me, this is a drawing of my father. And this is where I learned the lesson um, about delivering one's proposition. About 10 years ago, 12 years ago, my father, by the way, my father is uh, alive and well. He's 86 years of age. 85 years of age, 85 years of age. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, he was diagnosed with an aneurysm of the aorta. Uh, now, I'm going to go through a process here, and by the time I'm finished, you will think I carried out the surgery myself, okay? He was diagnosed with an aneurysm on the aorta. And as I'm sure most of you know, the aorta runs down the middle of you here. It's the, the, the major blood vessel running from top to bottom. 
And an aneurysm is described as, do you remember years ago when you used to go out on your bicycle and you'd come home and you'd throw the bike against the wall, you go into the house, you come back out the next morning, there's a bubble on the side of the tire. It's a weakness in the tire or the tube. If it bursts, you're dead. It's over. Even if you're in a hospital, right, there's nothing they can do if it bursts before they get it. He was diagnosed with one, but it was small at the time and they monitored it. Eventually it got to the crucial point, we have to operate. Now, I want to go through the process here. First of all, he was consulted by a professional surgeon who was regulated obviously by the medical council or whatever, so we knew that fact. So the person that was going to carry this out was very, was qualified and regulated to do it. The surgeon in question said to my father at the time, look, I don't want any awkward questions after this operation has been carried out. If you have any questions, bring your family in, gather them around now. So we all went into the hospital, we sat down. He came in, looking, I'm pointing at Paul again, looking the part. He was dressed in scrubs. He had uh, those, what do you call those, crocs on his feet. He looked the part, he had a stethoscope around here, and he had a pen and a piece of paper. And he sat down and he drew this out. We know what the proposition is. Mr. McGrory, I'm going to try and keep you alive. That's the proposition. He sat down and he started to draw this out. Now what that drawing is telling you as I go through it, you'll see what I mean. Mr. McGrory, we are going to take an external tube from your neck. We're going to run it down to the lower part of your body. It will be external from your body. We're then going to obviously put you out and all that. We're going to open you up. We're going to clamp the aorta up here, down here. We're going to cut out the middle section where the aneurysm is. We're going to take it over to a table on the side. We're going to roll it out. And we are going to stitch a piece of pig gut into it. We are going to roll it back up. We're going to put it back in where it belongs and restitch it. Job done. So he told us in very clear terms how he was going to deliver his proposition. I'm going to keep you alive and this is how I'm actually going to do it, okay? And here, which is the thing I learned in the CFP when I was doing that, he followed it on by pointing out the possible issues in achieving the target, i.e. keep my father alive. And the issues were, Mr. McGrory, until such time as we open you up, we can never be sure of what damage is in there. We don't know how badly damaged the aorta is or isn't. And when we go to put you back, you could get a leak on the stitching up here or below here. We feel from our investigations before the operation, i.e. our fact find, that you will be able to withstand all this and we don't see any complications. One area we can't cover off is the hardest part is getting, when we take out the external tube, is getting the top part connected back with the bottom part. They are the issues. So the point I'm making to you is, in one fell swoop, we knew this fellow was professional, educated. We knew what the proposition was. We knew how he intended to deliver the proposition. And we knew what the potential issues in achieving the goal were going to be. That, and that's why I just used a different story, is what we have to be able to do with our clients. So let's get on to delivering our service. To quickly run through this, how am I on time? Okay, right. Uh, delivering the service. For the purposes of this, what I want to say is, let's assume we meet a client in OMAC for the first time. The very first time, we haven't even had a meeting yet. I will always say to them, look, come on in. We'll do this meeting at our expense. That throws up the whole expense thing, which I spoke about. It gives me an opportunity to talk about fees or commissions or whatever, or the payment structure, okay? And they come in. We go through at that first meeting, and that's all we do is our client proposition, how we're going to deliver it, and maybe discuss some of the obvious issues that are arising from the first meeting. 
Our second meeting, and this is the bit I want to get to. On our second meeting, the client has agreed. That's great, I'm happy with that. Uh, so they come back for the second meeting. At the second meeting, we immediately move to an asset statement. That's the first place we go, is the asset statement. I want to know the assets, okay? There's a couple of other things I do, but the first thing is the assets, and basically we start to write down the assets, and you know what I mean by that, all the financial assets, houses, cars, boats, holiday homes, whatever, jewelry, whatever you have, right? We list the assets down. While we're listing the assets down, we would often have conversations with the client, oh, that's a, you know, that's a lovely place to have a property, how did you come by that, where did you get it? You know, oh, I mortgaged it, or I inherited it, or this or that or the other. Uh, and we go down through all of the assets that they have, and we generally have a discussion about it. The reason we do that is, you would be amazed, because when you sit down with a client and you ask him what assets, you're sitting there and you have not got a clue at this point in time what he has, and he knows everything he has, he or she, they know everything they have. But you will be amazed at the powerful, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but you'll get it when I say it in a minute, the impression that they get. When you have that asset statement completed and you turn it around on the desk and shove it back towards them, that they can look at it. Although they've given you all the information, they already knew it. When they see that written down, and you have had various conversations with them in relation to mortgages that they cleared and so on and so forth, right? Their job, you ask them, well, okay, well, I, I was earning good money then and I this and I that and I the other. That they don't be long coming around to realize that the best asset they have is themselves. And that's where I want to go first. I am a big believer in two things first, and I can do and have done, and I have a few clients that are exceptionally wealthy and we've done detailed financial plans for them, investment structures, the whole lot. But where our team goes first is to get the client to recognize that they are their best asset. There is no other asset they have that's more important than themselves. And funny enough, when they see their own asset statement put back in front of them, the penny starts to drop. At that meeting, we would also discuss their goals, their objectives, and their aspirations. Now, I didn't use that trio of words just to describe goals all over again. We try to narrow it down with the clients by saying to them, a goal to me is something that's to be scored in this game. So a goal is something that's to be achieved now, this year. An objective is something that I want to build on, and an aspiration is something the client aspires to eventually get into. We try to put all that together. We then have a look at their income. And to go back again to your earnings per call, commissions, fees, and bearing in mind we all know that in a couple of years, there's changes coming down the road. One of the reasons uh, why I start off with, uh, we'll do the first meeting at our expense, is to get the client into the position where there are services that we provide that is done on a fee basis. A case in point, there was two clients we have leaving our office one day and they had been upstairs with the accountant. And they came down and were heading out the door. And one of them said to me, Liam, can I have a word with you? I said, yes. I said, come on in here for a second. And uh, he went in and he said, look, Liam, I'm not accusing anybody here of putting their hand in the pocket. But he says, your man is loaded. He has a new car. He goes on holidays every year. You know, he's plenty of money. And I never seem to have any money. I don't know what I'm doing. I never seem to have anything, right? So I said to him, look, don't worry about it. I said, look, let's get an appointment in the diary. Come in and visit us. I said, yourself and your wife come in. Great. Now, I deliberately said to him then, when you're coming in, bring me in your domestic budget. What did you say then? I said, when you're coming in, bring in your domestic budget. Now, I would know the client quite well. He said to me, what are you talking about? He said, I haven't got a domestic budget. And I said, hold on a second. You've just spent the last two hours upstairs there speaking with your accountant. 
And what were you doing? You were setting out the expenses for the company next year. You were setting out your budgets. And you were setting out your targets to, for your sales and whatever, right? And I said, what is the largest expense coming out of that company? Your salary and your man's salary. The two largest expenses coming out of that. You're telling me you have a turnover of X amount, which between the two of you, you're taking 50% of that, and you don't know what you're spending your own money on. Now, the point I was trying to get across, when he came in, we did out a personal budget for him, okay? Charged him a fee, and he went off. Delighted, absolutely delighted. Thought it was the best thing he ever had. And we got two referrals out of it. So, what I'm saying to you is, there are a whole load of services that are out there that can be charged, okay? The final thing we do, I'm coming back to it again, when we meet with a client on the second meeting, we could spend 10 or 15 minutes discussing this. Review dates. I'm back to review dates. The reason I'm back to review dates is I have discovered over the years, because as I said to you a long time ago, I'm not good at referrals. I personally am. Some of the team are very good at it. I'm not. So the reason I focus, and the reason we do as a team even focus on review dates is for a couple of things. It maintains a client relationship. If you set down a review date and stick rigidly to it, year in, year out, losing a year, depending on the client, but if you stick rigidly to the review dates, you have a client for life. The same as I mentioned to you about the scoring sheet. If you review the client, and when I say review the client, it can be a review of how are you keeping. I haven't spoken to you in two or three months. Thanks, goodbye. In other words, it can be a very social type engagement with the client. But if you review them, I can absolutely guarantee you and stick to the review dates. You have a client for life, you will have referrals from that client and you will probably get a lot of clients from a lot of new clients from that client's family so i can't overestimate the whole thing on referrals so by our third meeting we want to make sure before we even get into the whole personal the the, the investment aspect of the whole thing by our third meeting we are focusing on Next up, his will, very, very important, and his personal protection. And an exercise I learned a long, long time ago, but it's just that it has become much better now. I, I, I came across it again and I had forgotten about it for years and years and years. And when I was doing the grad dip, it came up in that, which is this whole notion of human capital. When you look at somebody's asset statement, and I have said that as far as I would be concerned, their best asset is themselves. The human capital, I have a son at the moment, he's about to leave university. Uh, I am going to use a little bit of bad language here. He has not got an arse in his trousers. He hasn't got a penny. But he's about to leave Maynooth University with a, your basic degree. But what he does have, is huge human capital. I worked out that if he starts a job tomorrow on a basic salary of about 30,000 a year, and it escalates just normally over his lifetime, he's going to earn well over two million euro in his lifetime. So if you had something today that you knew was going to earn you two million over the next 30 years, what would you do with it? First thing you do, obviously, is insure it. So what we try to make sure with the client is by showing them, as you go through life, your human capital comes down and your financial capital is supposed to go up. And that's where we, as advisors, come into our own. It's our job to balance both, to make sure that what's left in human capital is protected and what's coming out the other side in financial capital has been managed correctly. Um, I now want to move on to personal disciplines. Uh, 
There's a famous story told about um, a less than savoury businessman in America back in the 1800s. And he used to walk every morning from his house to his office. And on the way, there was a church. And he used to go into the church and he'd walk up the aisle, bow his head, and he'd say, Lord, grant me physical health, mental strength, and I'll steal the rest. <laughs> Turn around and walk out the door, down the aisle and out of the church. And he used to do that every day, going to his office. Now, while that sounds when you say it, you know, yeah, right. Funny enough, if you think about it another way. If you have physical health and mental strength, everything else in your personal life, in your business life, you can sap, you can take out of life. So long as you're fit and healthy and you're grand, you're, you're mentally thinking straight, you will make do, you'll get by, you will get everything else you need. They're the only things you need. And I'm not going to go on about uh, physical health here. We all know, I'm fed up listening to it myself. I'm one of these yo-yo people. Uh, I'm currently, I was told the other day, I'm about two stone overweight. Two years ago, I was told I looked too skinny. Uh, so I'm one of these yo-yo people. I go up and I go down. I am very, very conscious of my, my physical health. I, while I don't look it, I do a certain amount of training here and there and everywhere, okay? The bit I want to get to, which is fundamental, particularly if we go back to the team, the bit I want to get to is your engagement. And that's up here in your head. Is to make sure, which is impossible, I might add, is to make sure that every morning when you get up, you are mentally engaged, okay? And in the recent times with the recession and all that, you can find that your engagement in the business is not where it should be. And it's very, very difficult to spot when you're engaged, fully engaged, and when you're not fully engaged. And I accept one, it's not something that we can, you will consistently do, it's just not possible. Um, but it's something that we need to be aware of. There's another great story told, and while it's a bit of a corny joke, it does make the point very, very well of another gentleman who goes into a church, kneels down, and says, Dear Lord, things have been very, very tough over the last number of years. I've lost a good bit of money in my business, fallen out with the wife, things ain't going great. Money is really, really short. I'm in a bad, bad way. I know I haven't come in to see you that often. But I wonder, would you be able to see your way to let me win the lotto? It would be a big help. Thank you, Lord. I'll be back next week. He came back the next week a little bit more exasperated. Lord, I'm in serious difficulties. My creditors are chasing me. My wife has said if I don't book up, she's going to put me out. She wants me to leave. I'm still not getting on at business. Things are really in a bad way. I don't need to win that much. If you could help me out, I'd be very grateful. I'll be back next week. He goes back the following week, completely exasperated. Lord, please. I'm in such bad straits. Please, could you help me out? I don't mind. I don't need to win that much. But if I win enough, I'll donate a lot of it even to charity. Please. And with that, there's a statue up, and the statue comes to life, and the statue looks at him and says, My son, yes, I am your Lord and Master. I am all powerful. But I only can do so much. I beg of you, would you please buy a ticket in the lottery? <laughs> and the point I'm trying to get to, we all go out there a lot of times 
believing we're engaged when we're not actually engaged in what we're doing. Various things come along that will knock us from one side to the other. And it's something that we need to just monitor. While you might be going through your own disciplines in your own business and you feel that you're doing everything that you should be doing, right? Now, that's why I want to come up, come back to the question I asked you at the beginning. You've done a bit of business, you're on your way home. Are you relieved? Are you excited? Or are you relieved? And of course, the answer to that more than likely should be, I'm excited. But is it relieved excitement? Okay. What I mean by that is, if you're excited, it means that the processes you are using and totally excited, what you're actually thinking in your head is, I did a very, very good job there. That client understood what I was saying. You were engaged, you were focused, you were excited. And what you were excited about is to put your theories and your plans and your disciplines to the test on the next client that you meet. That's excitement. If it's relieved excitement, there's a problem somewhere, and that's a great way of picking, I'm not totally engaged here. If it's relieved excitement, there's an issue somewhere in your process, in something that we are doing as advisors, okay? And that is how I decide whether I'm engaged, truly engaged, or not. Um, and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, oh, thank you very much. When I was young, I wanted to compete. When I went blind, I wanted to go further. back, I just wanted to walk again. This concludes our presentations. Uh, we will now have a question and answer session with all the speakers. There are roving mics available. And can I ask you please to let us have your name and the speaker to whom you're addressing the question to. I'll just ask the speaker, speakers to come to the podium. So as I say, we have roving speakers out, or ro roving mics out there, I should say, sorry. Um, so if there are any questions, all I can see is lights, but there are people on the floor that will find you there. So do we have any questions from the floors? Um, Chairman, uh, Ivan Kennedy's my name. 
Liam, uh, just a question for you. You mentioned about the changes you see coming in the whole fee and commission area. I just want to know what changes do you see coming and what are you doing about it to face them? Sorry, I just didn't hear the last part of the question, Ivan. Uh, the, on the fee and commission issue yeah. uh, and the changes you see, what changes do you see coming and how are you planning to deal with them? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I definitely wouldn't be an expert on the exact changes that are arriving. But I would believe that in the next couple of years, I think in 2017, there's a number of directives coming from Europe. Um, and I'm assuming, and I am making that assumption, that we will probably, not because they did it, but I, I think that the whole area of, of commissions on investment products and pensions is certainly going to be looked at in a big way, the same as it was in the UK. And I, I believe, I've no evidence, I haven't studied it in any way, but I absolutely believe, and I think we all know that, that at some stage there will be an attempt uh, to abolish commissions in the structure of you know, a certain percentage of the capital amount invested being paid as the form of a commission. Um, that it will be, uh, it will have to be done on a fee basis. In relation to what OMAC Life would do about that, we will do, um, probably continue to do what we've always done. Uh, in most times when we're dealing with clients, we would, at the time of discussing expenses and fees and so on and so forth, um, we, which I, I, I know, and I know from a number of you out there that I've spoken to at various times, but OMAC Life always operate on, on a fee basis. We don't do trail commissions, but I have no issues with that at all. We just operate on a straight fee. And that goes back in history, in, because my father, who was actually a, a, a practicing accountant, he always charged fees. I was only saying this this morning. He always charged fees. So from our point of view, we currently would do a lot of investments into products you know, your typical 50,000, your 100,000, whatever it is, invested into a product, and we would do that on a fee basis. And down the road, I see us uh, continuing to do that. That's where I feel. Is that answering your question, Ivan, now? Or? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Ivan. Do we have further questions out there? Mark, perhaps I could ask you one here from, from the, the floor. Um, in the 43 days in Antarctica, was there any time you thought to yourself, I can't do this, I have to go back? Uh, oh, near enough every, uh, like, when you arrive in Antarctica, there's a thing called polar, polar shock, right? So a lot of people do what I described, do all the training, raise the money, they fly to the edge of Antarctica, and there, there are reasonably large amount of stories of people, when they see the Russian plane flying off from the edge of Antarctica, they totally lose it. It's called polar shock. And they, there are many stories of people who never start the expedition. Right, so uh, now I wanted to get started, but on the first day of acclimatization, uh, you know, which was 10 hours on the skis, uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to be there. So from day one, I was doubting it. There's also a chemical thing that happens in the body when you're doing really long distance races that you start to become overly emotional, both big highs and then two minutes later you could be in the depths of despair. So every day in cycles, every sort of half hour, you'd really want to be there and you'd really want to not be there. <laughs> uh, so it, it, you know, largely speaking, the preparation, the fundraising, the training, the climatization and the race itself were awful. Uh, <laughs> You've just sold it. But, but I, think, I think this is an important thing, and it's probably why people are, you know, remain in, in, in business. Like, if you look back at anything that you do, anything that's dead easy, uh, well, you usually forget it. You don't value it. Whereas stuff that's difficult, where you come to the brink of failure, like, I don't advocate that you have to fail, and it's really good to fail, but you come to the brink of failure, you get through it, and you keep going. It's, it's that sort of stuff that you get to the end of the year, the end of the project, that you look back and say, that was worth doing. And that's what the South Pole had written all over it. If it was too easy, I wouldn't be up there talking about it. Very good, thank yeah. you, Mark. Any further questions from the floor? Eddie, speaker. Eddie. I would 
like to address this question to uh, Mark again. We saw in the film, Mark, that everything in the South Ant uh, the Antarctic was fairly normal, really, because what I've read about the Antarctic and Tom Crean, and, and especially in all of the explorers that went there, I just want to know what dangers did you come across? Did you meet any of these crevices that you spoke about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it looked too cushy <laughs> going along in a, in a line. I'm sure there were times when it wasn't so cushy. Yeah, well, the, 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 peop the people who favour the North Pole, and I, I, I was there, so I can kind of agree, well, I was only there for five days. They, the people who, favor, who like going to the North Pole, they say it's much harder at the North Pole because it opens up and it's much colder and it's a bit damp. So in comparison to the North Pole, Antarctica is indeed quite cushy, but uh, there are crevasses. We did go through crevasse fields. Uh, I have some frostbite and scars on my leg from the experience. Simon's fingers are intact, but, but damaged. Uh, but we prepared so hard and so well, and we put the right kind of balance in our team you know, we could have gone down there with three relatively inexperienced people, but Inga uh, had been to the North Pole seven times and Antarctica four times, never to the South Pole. He brought all of the experience and the balance in the team that, that, that we needed because it is dangerous. And if we got it wrong, um, we would have lost fingers, lost toes, or fallen down those crevasses. But we had the right balance in the team and, and, and made it through. So it was, uh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a holiday, but, uh, but it was manageable. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. I think I saw another hand go up there, yeah. There's one here. There's two there, sorry, yeah. Uh, Kevin, it's uh, Anthony here, Anthony Kavanagh. I have a question for Mark. Just, obviously, in terms of the, the accident that you had, and you mentioned about the psychologist when you were in the, in the spinal unit, and the transition from being a, an optimist to a realist, how important was your support network? Was it an internal driver? that turned you from being a, a, an optimist to a realist, or was it part of your support network that helped you make that transition? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people who these things haven't happened to yet, uh, although that's what half the insurance business is about, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, say they'd never be able to cope with it, but you know, actually what happens is most people do cope with it, um, cope with it quite well. Now, I suppose, speaking from my own, my own experience. And the reason I feel both privileged to have access to my robotic legs and all the stuff that I, I spoke about, but also a responsibility to get it out of the labs and into, into human beings is because, you know, I had my, my fiance, my family, my friends, my backup, my fundraising uh, opportunities, uh, you know, all of that, all of that network. Uh, means that there's no coincidence that I, out of a lot of the people who I was in the ward with, I'm doing better than most of them. Not all of them, but, 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 but most of them. Uh, and it is because of that network. So I think you know, it was the same with the, the South Pole, 500 on the flag, the great guys on the team. It's pretty much the same with any, anything you do. You cannot, you can do it on your own. You just can't do it brilliantly on your own. And I think the, the network, uh, you know, certainly it's, uh, it's very worthwhile acknowledging that, that network and the support that we all have. And as Liam was mentioning, go back to the earlier point, uh, just having people coming along for the ride, staff, I think you mentioned, um, is quite different from having people on your team. And I certainly have people on my team. Thank you, Anthony. I think Ted Dwyer has a question here. radical thinking in relation to the way our business is structured. And I think the fact of, of talking about you know, doing the first meeting at our own expense rather than for free is, is fundamentally important. Could you give us roughly an idea of what kind of fees you charge? I mean, if somebody wants some kind of a report, do you charge per hour or do you charge on the report you do? Uh, and would most of your income, so I mean, a lot of your income would be on a fee basis. Um, well, first of all, uh, no, it's, it's, it, most of our income wouldn't be on a fee basis. We would still have a very, very good percentage that comes in on, on a commission basis of one way or the other. I am personally, I am not, 
I am not suggesting that you know we should all go fee-based. Fee-based has its ups and it certainly has its downs. And certainly in the recent recession, uh, anyone who's out there who has been charging fees, it's very, very difficult um, if during a recession, one has to remember that it's very hard to collect fees because along with the likes of accountants and that, we're in the position where somebody is coming in to you, you're advising them maybe the other way around this time where you're trying to help them to get out of some bad situation. You're going to charge a fee, but you know already they don't have the money to actually pay the fee, right? And they know that you know that, right? So it can be very, very difficult at times. So first of all, the point I want to make, we do charge fees because we are, we say to the client, it's. This is what we're looking for. This is the amount we're going to charge. Here are the ways you can pay it. Uh, in relation to what we charge, Ted, I have to say, again, I'm going back a bit into history. I absolutely would not be an expert on this, except to say that basically at our first meeting or our second meeting, we get a very, very good feel of the amount of work that is going to have to go in to do whatever the, the client has asked us to do. And based on that, we would charge out a fee, and it's usually based in and around an hourly rate, and we, we have come up with that hourly rate by dividing down the amount of work that we do on a year-by-year on -year basis. When I mentioned earlier about our, our EPC, I said to you to do that, say, for one year. It's amazing if you go back over a number of years and carry out the same exercise and get an average, right? it actually gives you a very, very accurate charge out hourly rate, okay? Because if you go back over three or four years and work out how much you took in in relationship to the amount of work you were doing, the hours put in by maybe different people on the team that would be charged out at different, at different rates, but basically the way we're doing it, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that there's any scientific um, uh, formula used for this, but to answer the question directly, it would be on an hourly rate based on historical information that we have about the amount of time it takes to do the work. Is that answering the question, Ted? Any further questions? Okay, Mark, I suppose just to put that question that Eddie posed to you there about the trip to Antarctica looking um, very easy, to put it in perspective. Eddie goes swimming in Salt Hill 365 days of the year. Oh, so maybe he might join you on your next expedition. <laughs> Before closing, I would like to call on LIA President Willie Holmes to make a presentation to our three speakers, a small gesture of our appreciation. Once again, I would like to thank our three speakers for travelling to be with us today, for their advanced preparations, for what were excellent presentations. Also to our President Willie Holmes for being with us today. I would also like to thank my fellow Limerick Region Committee members for their support, and all the team at LIA, particularly Rebecca McGee, Emma Hill, Lorraine Keeley, and Stephen Langton for their support in organising today's event. I would also like to thank the staff in the hotel for the excellent service and the facilities today. 
To all of you who attended today, thank you for joining us, and I hope you have an enjoyable lunch. For those who are traveling distances, have a safe journey home, and once again, thank you all.